Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Brian Irwin, and I'm the uh, head of digital capability at Sheffield Hallam University. Um, let's see if I go to the next slides. Um, so as, as Penny said, uh, we will be taking questions during the session, because there's uh, two of us. Ian's also on here, and he's going to be um, He'll be answering the questions in the beginning, and then he'll do part of the second half of the presentation, and I'll sort of pick up any questions in the chat. So if you do have anything that we haven't clarified, please put it there. If there's anything in particular um, that maybe Ian thinks we should discuss, I should discuss more, then uh, we'll sort of take it back into the main presentation as well. Um, so just a really quick um, sort of introduction to Sheffield Hallam University. Uh, for those of you who aren't familiar, we are in the north of England, a uh, fairly modern university from 1992 and in a city center. We have about, actually, it's 33,000 students, it's a slightly old number, and 2,100 academic staff. Um, we do use Blackboard Learn as our primary VLE as well as Blackboard Collaborate, but we also have many other uh, tools available. and. Um, this approach is to, doesn't just encapsulate use of the, of the virtual learning environment, but is also looking at use of technology in the classrooms, as well as um, other tools that might be used, such as Google Docs or ePortfolio software, or uh, it, really a variety of different approaches. Uh, so in terms of the context of the approach that we did take, uh, it started really on building on something we, we developed called the minimum expectations of e-learning. Uh, we had a lot of comments from students, a lot of feedback that we got from surveys and other sources uh, that the there wasn't a consistency across the e-learning experience that they were having. So we developed these minimum expectations as a way of, of establishing some principles, and the first one being there should be a Blackboard site for each module that we teach uh, equally. It should have certain information in it that students would need, um, such as their grades, or marks, um, staff contact details, and other information. Um, so we introduced that, but one of the things we were conscious of is we didn't want people to just kind of do that, because many of the things were really about giving students administrative information. They weren't really about teaching using technology and teaching in a different way. So um, and that was a strong thing we really wanted to do, was make sure we were achieving what I would call the potential of technology-enhanced learning. I think this is a challenge that many institutions can recognize of kind of, there were some people who were doing great things, but how do we get the majority of people to kind of move forward and then practice and really think about uh, using more active ways of, of doing teaching so that students are, or are doing more active learning, um, variety of teaching approaches. that. I would say our sort of default mode of teaching was kind of show presentation to students. It wasn't uh, necessarily involving a lot of interaction. Not to say, of course, that people aren't doing that. It's about that consistency and how you push that wider across the institution. And then last one is kind of more use of technology as a way of facilitating those things. I think, again, we had very mixed use. Some areas doing it really well and some areas not doing it very much at all. So around the time that we had introduced these minimum expectations of e-learning, uh, there was a, a big national change project called Changing the Learning Landscape, uh, which was sort of launched by several um, organizations across the UK in collaboration. And so anyway, it was, it was sort of an ideal opportunity for us to set aside some time to do this and have a bit of a, a framework by which we were um, working on this challenge of how do we get people to go beyond the minimum and really improve their teaching. Um, so what we did is uh, we decided we wanted to sort of form a project around this. So it was going to be Sheffield Hallam, which is to Sheffield Hallam University based. Um, we wanted it to reflect the teaching practice that was happening at Sheffield Hallam University. There was kind of a, there's quite a lot of information out there around you know use of technology enhanced learning and the sort of different tools and different techniques you might use. We wanted things that people were already doing and that were very you know that were possible here. We didn't want uh, someone to kind of go. Oh yeah, well we you know we saw a wonderful thing with Turnitin's grade mark at this other institution, and they read about it, get excited, and find out we don't have that, and they can't really do that here. Um, so that was part of it. Also, the fact that people could talk to somebody at the institution about it, and it, it sort of just try to make the thing very real for them. 
Uh, we wanted it to be very grassroots as a kind of bottom up type approach. Uh, so we invited all academics to take part in the development of um, of the resource, which we'll talk about, Ian will talk about later. Um, we, we adopted a principle of sort of constant refinement that we were kind of trying to go and create something that would be a useful resource for academics around thinking about their teaching, the different ways they could teach, and how technology fit into that. But we weren't sure we were going to, we were pretty sure we weren't going to get it right the first time. Um, and also because we wanted it to be something that was actually useful to academics and to instructional designers as well, then we needed their feedback to understand what, what that would actually look like. Um, so we weren't precious around creating things that didn't work. We, we created things and then we, we changed it so it, it would work. Um, in terms of the project steering group, we drew it from, we had a representative from the Students' Union, we had um, practicing academics, and we had tele support staff um, involved in the, in the project. And now Ian's going to pass over to Ian, uh, my colleague, who will now talk about the project, how it was developed, and some of the outputs and things that we got from it. Okay, thanks, Brian. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Ian Glover, uh, and I'm going to talk about the actual development of the project. Um, so the first thing that we did as part of this uh, project was to send out a survey that all academic staff could take part in. It was a very simple survey. It had three questions. We were asking, um, tell us about your current practice what works well, what would you like to improve. We weren't specifically asking them anything about their use of technology, although we, there was um, you know, a follow-up point that please do tell us if you want to, but we didn't want to focus on that um, in this case. And because of that, we actually got, uh, we got f about 40 to 50 responses, which is quite good for this kind of um, practice type survey, just a small informal survey. Um, but because we weren't specifically asking about technology, we didn't just see the same people, you know, the, uh, the technology innovators, it wasn't just those people who were taking part in this survey and sending us their practice, it was a wider range of people. So what happened after we got the survey was that myself and another colleague, Stuart Heppelstone, uh, we kind of collated that information, we did a thematic analysis of the comments that people sent back and categorised the types of activity that people are doing. From that, we came up with a framework, as we called it at the time, which is basically a grid um, showing the different types of practice that people were doing, including the different tools and different techniques that people had said that they were using. We then took that to um, a series of workshops. There was over 100 people involved. Uh, academic staff members could sign up to, this, uh, to these workshops. Over 100 of, them, 100 of them did, where we then fleshed out the, um, the grid that would produce the framework. And one of the first things that um, was said was that they didn't like the word framework. Um, and they wanted it to be menu. Framework sounded too um, officious and something like you have to do, um, whereas menu, which we quite liked as a metaphor because it, um, it suggests something that you can pick from. So we're not saying that you have to do all of these or any of these, it's something that you can pick and choose from. Um, so we took the, the um, resources that we developed at that point to these workshops, further refined it. Again, it's that um, constant refinement that Brian was talking about, and came up with a draft menu and materials, which I'll show you in a moment. Um, from that, once we had that draft, again, we had another round of um, student workshops, and we also publicized the, the materials uh, internally, and just tried to gather some feedback. So further feedback, further refinements um, to produce some in the, you know, was grassroots that staff at Sheffield Hallam um, had contributed to and therefore could see the value of and see how it would fit in with their particular practice. So here at the bottom of the screen is an example of um, the menu. There's also a link there which I think Brian is going to paste into the, uh, into the chat window. So you can open that, you can have a look at the full um, the menu. We've really started to create a commons so that anyone can take it and use it however you want. But basically, um, it's a grid with different categories of um, learning approaches. So overall categories, independent learning, peer-based learning, that kind of thing. Within the specific um, approaches that you might take, the benefits of taking that approach, some assessment types that work well with that approach. Then we're into the technology. So technologies that have been used at Sheffield Hallam to support um, that particular teaching approach, benefits of using the technology, and then there's those further case studies. Of, the case studies tend to be uh, Sheffield Hallam people, again, as Brian said, it's so that uh, anyone who's interested in something that they've found on here can go along and you know, have a chat with someone just down the corridor rather than have to uh, 
you know, go to a conference and chance to meet them kind of thing. So there's a lot of extra information there for them. The way that we built it was that um, this menu, you can dive in, in and use it in several different ways. You can start right at the left and explore alternative teaching approaches. So you can start right from the beginning and say, I want to look at uh, different ways of teaching. You know, I want to find out what might work better for my practice and my students. You can start from there, so starting from the left and reading across. Um, you can start in the middle and you're already happy with your teaching approaches, but you want to find some technologies that work well with that um, teaching approach. Start in the middle, you know, go down, find your teaching approach, start in the middle and uh, work your way right. I uh, should say right from the middle and on the slide. Uh, work your way right, find the technologies and investigate those further. Um, or, uh, this isn't a way that we really promote or suggest that people should do, is to, again, I've got left and right confused, <laughs> um, start in the middle and then look at the technologies that you are using and you want to use and then work left and find some teaching approaches that they work well with. So there's a few different ways that people can use this um, menu to explore their practice. The, uh, you can see some of the links on the image here, or if you've opened up the, um, the full menu, you can click on those. The links are to further details and resources, so background information, case studies, um, teaching nuggets which give them ideas about how they might use, like to use um, a particular teaching approach or technology. So there's quite a lot of information behind this, um, this large grid. So that was the menu, um, but we use this in workshops. So the way we use it in workshops is around thinking about your current practice, then going into the menu and using that to kind of think about what you might want to change in your practice. So to start with that, we have this reflective action planning worksheet, um, which Brian's just put a link to there. It's also on the slide. Um, and in there, it just gets people to think about their current practice and their spread of uh, technology across their modules. Um, the spread of teaching approaches across their modules, and it helps them to see if they're clustering um, you know, around a few different teaching approaches or a few different technologies, which might suggest that they want to investigate you know, branching out and trying something new. Um, equally, it can also show them if they are maybe spread too thin and using too many different teaching approaches and too many different technologies in a module, which is equally as bad because the students kind of can't really get a feel for uh, any consistency when you, you've spread too thin like that. So this reflective uh, action planning um, sheet, it takes them through that, then we have some activities, and then right at the end, we come up with an action plan. The idea of the action plan is that they will fill out um, what they want to do based on the workshop and the discussions that they've had in the workshop, um, take a photo of it and send it to um, the team, you know, the, the um, facilitators of that uh, workshop, which would tend to be uh, people in the technology enhanced learning team, so the team that myself uh, and Brian are from, the people who have been uh, working on this. Uh, but equally, it could be a faculty team if that's um, who's been running the workshop. They would take that photo, um, send it to us, and then we would follow up on anything that they've said that they want some assistance with. So they might have identified something they want further information on in a couple of months' time. We'll just chase them up and uh, make sure they have that information and make sure that they can keep working towards uh, what they've put down in their action plan. One of the main activities that we've used in the workshops um, is a card sort. So you can see an image of the cards. Uh, along the bottom of the slide there. Basically, it's the, um, the statements, the benefits of the particular approaches um, from the menu put onto these cards. And how it usually works, we, we tend to allow people to be a bit flexible on how they work it, but how it usually works is they go through as a group. So this works particularly well if it's a, um, a course team, but it also works quite well if it's um, different you know, people from different faculties on an open session. But they'll go through and just kind of identify things that resonate with them, things that their uh, statements uh, and benefits that you know, they would like to realize. Um, and they go through and they categorize these into things like this is something that they like, something that they currently do, um, something that they don't do that isn't appropriate for their context. And from that, we can start to see, because of the color coding of the cards, where it's looking like um, a particular teaching approach might help them. So if you look on the, the image at the bottom of the uh, slide there, you can see there's two um, slides that are white with a purplish background, which relates to practical project work. So in this particular case, it might be something that um, the course team would like to look at, some a bit more practical project work. Um, so we can, we can work from that. But then what we do is we flip the cards over, and on the back are the um, technologies from the particular teaching approach. 
what this allows us to do is look across all of the cards and see, for instance, that you've got lots of cards in using different teaching approaches, but they all um, are really well supported through the use of blogs, for instance. So we could then you know, have a look and say, okay, well, maybe regardless of the teaching approaches that you're actually using, maybe blogs are something as are a technology solution that you should perhaps look into a bit more, um, and we can we can steer um, the conversation down that route as well. Um, so we use these um, the discussion. As I say, it's quite free form. These uh, the cards are basically just a focal point for the discussion, um, but we also use it to challenge assumptions. So it's quite nice when you get people, you know, on a particular course team going through the cards, saying, "Yeah, we do that. That's uh, we just as a matter of course." But then one person said, "Well, actually, do we really do that?" Um, so we can use these to challenge that. But another good one, certainly in the open sessions, is sharing practice. So through the cards, so we can, um, you can have people discussing their current practice and spreading practice beyond its boundaries, so beyond the course team uh, and spreading it across the university, which unfortunately I think in most institutions is something that doesn't happen often enough where great ideas kind of um, hit a wall when they try to leave a department or a faculty. Um, this helps break down some of that and get those ideas shared. Okay, so those are the main resources um, that we've used. So there's the menu and the worksheet, but then also some of the activities. I mean, we do have other activity uh, scenarios as well um, that we sometimes use. We, we do vary what uh, what we use in the, the particular sessions, but um, those are the um, those are the um, main things that we do in the workshops and the main resources. So how we actually got this um, these workshops out there and got the uh, the menu out there and stuff. Um, the internal dissemination of the project. Uh, the main thing that we did was to support uh, faculty tell staff to use this in their work. Um, at Sheffield Talent, the faculty tell staff are the ones who have the day to day conversations with most academic staff. So we're the central team, but they're the ones who are you know, having those conversations regularly. Um, which isn't to say that we don't, but they're the ones who uh, are on the front lines, as it were. So we supported them in using this to inform their conversations. So um, using the language from the menu in their conversations and steering people towards the resources and things that would be developed as part of this, um, this process was a big part of uh, the internal dissemination. Similarly, we also run workshops. So these were a big part of you know, actually getting us getting out to the academic staff. Um, we ran two different types of workshop. There were ones that were open to everyone, so people from all across the institution could come to an open workshop, share their practice, discuss what they're doing, find out ideas from each other, um, and get some ideas from you know, the materials that we've produced as well. Um, but also we tailored workshops for specific groups. So it might be that a particular faculty wanted to look at, say, work-based learning. So rather than come with the full menu, we would come with just the work-based learning sheets. Um, and from that, we could, uh, we could have a much more focused discussion around the things that a particular faculty or a particular subject group wanted to do. Um, these were really good um, when we wanted to get you know, pr um, significant practice change. The open sessions were great, a lot of great conversation, but the ones tailored for specific groups for module teams are the ones where you're going to see um, you know, big changes to the um, future practice and the future um, teaching of the uh, of the group. So they were they were really good, a lot of really good discussion that led to significant changes in uh, teaching practice. Um, likewise, we also had uh, other forms of promotion. So we've got the um, faculty staff promoting this stuff. We also had workshops that uh, we were running. But also, there was just other promotion for people to pick up the materials and you know work with them um, outside of any kind of conversation or workshop that they might have with other people. So we promoted it through our blogs. We had mail out to all academic staff, just highlighting this resource and what people might be able to use it for. Another thing that we did was to target influencers. So they, in some cases, in some faculties, they were kind of um, people who had a formal tell type role um, or a uh, teaching, learning, and assessment role. Uh, in other places, they were um, just general academics, really. Who, you know, there's a little group coalesced around um, people who are interested in the use of TEL. So we targeted those people as well. Um, another thing that we did. This was partly to get um, 
some more interest in the tailored groups, but just generally to raise awareness as well, uh, was presenting to course and subject teams. So going out and actually getting in front of these groups and saying, here's this resource, here's this kind of stuff that we can do for you. Um, we can tailor this to however you want, whatever type of discussion. Um, we can fit in with a, a broader um, set of uh, development activities, if that's what you want. Uh, just getting out there and showing what we could provide. And then in the broadest context, faculty and full university conferences. So going out and just presenting this to all staff um, right across the board. Okay, so um, some of the feedback that we had, we had some great feedback. Uh, here's one that we received in an email and um, that's particularly good. Um, so the, the top bit there. And um, this is kind of some of this piece of feedback is similar to um, what we've received from other people as well. What we found is that people like having all of this information collated into one place in a fairly simple way. We try to simplify the language so it, it's not too um, you know, based around pedagogic theory and it's not too based around knowing a lot about technology. We try to base it so that anyone, even you know, a student, could pick it up and get an idea of, um, of what uh, teaching approaches would be possible and technologies that they might use. So we've had quite a few uh, pieces of feedback, both through email and informal, um, based around this, that it's, it's this combination of the different types of tell, the benefits and the learning approach, um, and then leading into actual practical case studies and practical information that people have found really useful. Um, there was recently a complete redesign of the information skills curriculum by the library and they came along to one of our, our targeted workshops and um, they really benefited from that because it, it really opened their eyes both to the potential of using technology in what they currently do but also different ways that they could engage the students, different types of activities that they could do with the students to make that particular quite often fairly dry subject uh, much more lively and much more engaging. So. Um, they were really pleased with that session and the outputs from that. Hey, Ian, um, it, uh, one second. There's been a question yeah. which I thought it might be worth you picking up. Uh, okay. Have a look from Pedro at Kingston University. Um, we don't tend to um, present the case studies directly within the workshops. Um, the workshops aren't really a place where we give out this uh, information. We, we work with the, the menu and then the links on there are kind of a follow-up activity. So we don't have the academic staff coming along and presenting their own case studies. Um, just being able to schedule that would be a nightmare to be honest. Um, and the, the workshops themselves are more around the people who are in the room discussing rather than you know, being presented with a piece of information um, and then discussing that. It's about discussing their current practice, using the menu to kind of explore things that they might want to do um, you know, in other ways. Um, so I hope that answers the question. Um, okay, um, so it's also been integrated into um, curriculum development materials. So when new courses are being developed, um, in some of the faculties, the menu and the uh, reflective worksheets and things are part of the materials that will be used to um, develop those new courses or redevelop existing courses. Um, and that helps bring a bit more of a, a tell point of view into um, the curriculum development um, stage as well. Um, and we've also had quite a few other universities, quite a few in the UK, but also intriguingly quite a lot in the Netherlands as well, um, interested in translating the materials to their context. So in some places, um, you know, they've seen the value of doing the entire process and um, the same way that we've done, taking that grassroots approach and reflecting uh, existing practice at their institution. Um, but in other cases, you know, people have wanted to take our materials and kind of just tweak them a little bit and use them in their own context. So um, as Brian said, these um, these materials are Creative Commons, so we're happy for people to, to take them and use them however they wish. But I would say that if you are wanting to use them, then the process is you know, very important. So we found it to be particularly important in getting engagement, just the idea of it reflecting practice and it being something that's been developed by the um, staff members at the institution. It was a really powerful thing for getting engagement further down the line. Okay, so 
some lessons that we've learned from this whole process is that, um, like anything, senior, uh, senior support is vital to get the non-innovators involved. Um, the way that we focused on you know, local focus really helped people see the value of the project, but it's still important to get senior support to be able to free up the time uh, and free up time on, say, um, departmental meetings and give us slots on there that we can go and run some sessions or even just do some um, awareness raising in those. So it was really important to be able to get those on board to do that and to give us that time and opportunity um, for that. But the local focus, by having names on that, um, that sheet on the menu that people probably do now because we took you know, it was a full spread across all of the faculties, having that on there makes it seem you know, much more tangible, much more local. These are things that clearly work in this institution. So it's not some you know, ivory tower type thing that happens somewhere else but would never work in this context. It's stuff that is proven to work in this context. So that was really useful um, for helping people engage with this. Avoiding jargon, um, both technology and pedagogy jargon was really important. Um, you know, a lot of people are perfectly happy with that jargon, but for some people it can um, disengage them a little bit. Um, so not having that jargon just cuts down an extra barrier for people to actually get, in it, get engaged and to discuss their, their practice and share and get ideas from each other. Um, and where possible, in incorporating it into the formal design process and the review process is, is really important because then you know it's being used right at the beginning. It's not someone coming in who's already doing some things, wanting to change a few bits and pieces. It's embedded, you know, the, the thinking about the teaching approaches and then the technology that might support that is embedded right from the beginning of the course design process. So that's really important too. And just finally, um, there's some contact details there. There's um, the address of our blog, but also Brian and my email addresses if you do want to get in touch with us. Um, as I said, if you want uh, copies of things like the um, scenarios that I briefly mentioned, but also the um, this card sort activity, all that kind of stuff, just drop me an email and I'm happy to send up. Uh, all of the stuff over to you. Um, the menu and the worksheet are already created comments, so just feel free to take those and use them how that you wish. But if you want any more information or you want access to some of the other resources, just let me know. Okay, um, Brian, is there anything you want to add? Uh, no, yeah, there's a few questions that have come okay. in just at the end, which I thought we could just start trying to pick up. And the first one was, how did you get senior level buy-in to develop and use such a menu? And I think um, you know, we, we got senior level buy-in it really helped to get single by into doing the project because of this national project that was happening. Changing the learning landscape was something that at the time our, our pro vice chancellor for learning teaching was sitting on the national committee for. He was he was on the on the board for the project. So um, it, obviously he wanted us to do something, and they gave us a very I suppose convenient excuse to say this is well this is what we really need to do, um, and. So it wasn't hard to get similar buy into the project. Uh, we didn't know we were developing a menu necessarily at the beginning of the project, but just a way of, of increasing that. So um, that was that question. Um, early days, do you think it would make a significant change such improvement in academic delivery and student engagement? I think you know in the groups that we've worked with, where you know it, they've agreed to essentially take this as part of the course design project um, design process, then it's been it has been a valuable way of thinking about it. And it, I would say one of, of some tools, you know, of a, of a suite of tools around um, course development. I don't think it necessarily stands alone completely. I mean, some people have said, oh, well, don't you start with what you want, you know, the learning outcomes to be or what you want the students to get. And of course, you need to start there, not how you want to teach them. You don't start with the teaching approach. Um, but it is a way of kind of getting people to think about different pedagogies, different teaching approaches they might not have, have thought about. And you know, in that way, it is, it is viable. And then thinking about the relationship between technology and, and pedagogies that are appropriate for them as well. Um, so I think, I think it has the, definitely has the potential to make a change. I think we have to really work to link it in better with some of our processes so that it is something that people are just sort of engaging with more rather than sort of opting into. And there was a question, what were the measures of success for the project? Um, in terms of that, I would say, you know, we, we wanted something that, as I said at the beginning, was grassroots, that was from the bottom up. That's something that staff could see and engage with. And learning technologists felt was valuable and staff felt was valuable. And we've gotten that, you know, we did, we've gotten a lot of very positive feedback from staff about it. So we didn't want something that was kind of a top down because that was 
it was kind of a counterweight to the uh, e-learning minimum expectations. Is there's something everyone must do, and they try to be very clear. Whereas when you try to do that about teaching, it's very problematic because actually we need different teaching practices for different disciplines, different people's styles, uh, the, the different scenarios that, that might be there is so complicated. But actually, so we didn't want to specify it must be this way. So we wanted to have something that could provide that. In terms of the actual project, we didn't. Um, there was it was about a year long, wasn't it? it, was, it was, yeah. yeah, about a year long. So we we didn't have um, a lot of time to kind of be able to do a lot. So some people in the initiative, I think, chose to really transform everything in a year. Not actually, we kind of tried to be more realistic and said we can really develop this menu and these resources in that year, rather than we can completely transform the whole institution in that year. We can have something we can start using with people. Um, so that was that was in terms of uh, what, we, what we did with that. Um, I think we have struggled a little bit this past year because we were hoping to follow on with a bit more than we've been able to do. And that was largely down to things like two staff members, uh, like losing two staff members from the team or things like that has, has affected our ability to kind of do it. Um, but. Um, Anyway, so then there was another point, which just oh, that's just the point, saying avoiding pedagogical jargon as well as technical jargon. I think actually that point partially came up when a presentation I was doing where I started talking about you know e-portfolios, and then somebody said, well, what are e-portfolios? And I said, well, you know, it's an online portfolio way of teaching a portfolio. And they said, well, what's a portfolio? <laughs> well, how do you teach a portfolio? So you know, I think we we have to. You, know, you can't assume that necessarily everyone that you're talking to is is clued in with some of the different teaching approaches that they might um, that they might you know could potentially use. And so part of it was to expose people to that as well as exposing people about the technology and just finding a way of kind of making those things make sense together for people. And then let's see, how did you get staff to come along to the sessions? Was another question. Um, so I'm just going my way down the list here. I would say that um, the answer to that is it varied. I mean, in some cases, um, with the open sessions, it's kind of entirely voluntary. People would come because they wanted to look at their their own teaching practice um, or their use of technology. Um, again, it, it tended to be people who were interested in the teaching practice more than the technology, which was really interesting. Um, but with the um, kind of the course team um, sessions, a decision was made within the course team that they would all come to that. So that was kind of mandatory within that course team. Um, departmental ones we have run, and um, they've been at kind of departmental away uh, away days and things like that. So it does vary. So we also um, did some basic learning and teaching conference, yeah, where we did a sort of post keynote and everyone sort of just went to to a session, and you know, so of course. You'd gotten people to sign up to the larger event, so just getting them to come along to a session wasn't that hard. Um, there was a question: Will this continue post CLL funding? Well, there actually was no CLL funding, so it's uh, that didn't really influence. It was more the kind of ability to carve out some work priority around this. What CLL provided was a series of sort of residential workshops to help people think through the process of planning, implementing, evaluating projects uh, rather than any particular funding that the, so that didn't really if, um, that hasn't affected that it's been more a matter of our internal resource that's made it a little more challenging this past year um, but I mean we have certainly continued with the concept we haven't continued developing a lot more for the menu but I also think it's probably at a good enough place that we could we can use it as it is so um, so, but what I question: How has the mini impacted the stu online student experience? Have you had feedback, and can this be measured? I think I mean that's always a challenge with a number of these initiatives, and particularly where you do something with staff development, and the effect may have an uh, impact on the student experience through teaching later. But you often don't see that for a period of years, and you don't always know the the kind of follow up that people have. So I think that's that is one of the challenges we have with a number of projects, and it, this happens to probably be one of those as well. Um, so there's some other questions about, you know, whether comment you'd like the terminology of menu instead of framework. Again, yes, yeah, so that came from staff. That was something that 
base set and get some framework to something, you have to do all of this. And that's what we had essentially for the, the expectations. We, it wasn't a framework. You didn't have to do all those things. We don't want someone to teach in every single way or try and take that, you know, I've ticked and I teach in all 20 ways. That wasn't the mm -hmm. purpose. Oh, well, thanks, Damien, for the uh, for the endorsement. <laughs> Good. <laughs> so there's some impact, obviously, happening there. Uh, in terms of the cards, we could uh, we should be able to provide someone else to take another card. Yeah. Um, they're not posted yet, but I'll put up a post on the. Um, the team blog that was just up on screen a moment ago, and um, I put a post on there with a link to the cards. So they're blogs.shoot.ac.uk slash shoot. I'll put a post up there today or tomorrow from where you can download the cards. And we should put the work worksheet link up there as well, yeah. since that was pointed to something uh, internal. Only. Yeah, I'll, put, I'll make sure all of the resources are up there. Are there any more questions? I think I've gone through, but if I missed one, please let me know. Well, I think, you know, there's a question, how do you avoid people using minimum standards as a tick box, which is conform to basic learning standards? And really, in a way, I would say that our minimum standards are very much about, uh, not about teaching, but very much about uh, almost the same sort of things that you would get with um, a face-to-face -face room of sort of students should be given a timetable, students should be um, told who their teachers are, you know, who their lecturers are. It, it's very much at that kind of almost administrative information. You should give the students information around their assessments. You should give them their marks online. You should, you should tell them, you know, what they're supposed to do in, in, the, in the online site, things like that. And so I think actually we do want that to be probably more of a tick box. It's about how we get them to go beyond that to kind of think about their actual teaching practice. And that's one of those things we're trying to kind of build in. We're kind of revising our minimum expectations to become more of an actual policy. Um, for the autumn, and then we want to be able to um, highlight things like the menu from that, so that people are thinking about different ways that they might consider teaching. But really, you know, they're also at a different level because I suppose for the minimum expectations, we're often expecting that that's kind of a requirement that each module will meet. Whereas really, if you want to talk about teaching, it's much more effective at a sort of course or program level, I think, um, because in terms of getting how those teachings fit together, how the, how things feels like a coherent whole for people, as well as how you get those people who are maybe more reluctant to change their teaching practice to consider something new. So that, to me, is, is how you, um, is, is maybe there's a difference between those two things in, in the sort of target of how you need to accomplish those. OK. Thank you. Thanks, Brian. Um, Thanks, Ian. Uh, if there's any any further questions, um, we can uh, either uh, collect them and you can send them to myself at askers at blackboard.com. Uh, the email address is on the um, web webinar confirmation that you received. We will be um, actually sending out the recording on Monday next week to the webinar. So um, everybody who registered will receive um, a link to that. We will also post any of the resources that Brian and Ian um, will share with us. So um, everybody registered for this session will get a copy and feel free to share those with your colleagues. Um, we would also like to just say thank you um, to Brian and Ian for taking the time out today to actually share their um, story with us. Um, it's been really, really useful and uh, great best practice uh, that you shared with us. Um, and also, thanks for everyone else for joining this session as well. Um, we hope that you found it useful. We would also like to mention before you leave, um, you know, we we want to improve future events. We want to make sure that we're we're providing you with uh, sessions that are useful to you um, and what you're trying to achieve. So be grateful if you could actually fill in a short survey for us. It'll take a couple of minutes. Um, we've just posted a link to that in the chat box there. So it's just short, ten questions, um, but it will just help us um, to. Uh, plan future events. And finally, um, if you found this webinar interesting and you want further information, as I mentioned at the beginning of the session, we have created the six characteristics to increase technology adoption guide. So 
Um, you can download that using the link that you can see on the screen or in the chat box there that Anna has posted. Um, if you do have any further questions, please drop us an email at askers at blackboard.com. If you have any stories, best practice that you as an institution would like to share um, wider, then please get in touch with us. Um, and thank you again for everyone joining us. Um, thanks, Brian and Ian, for presenting. And um, enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you.